Welcome to this learning module, Title IV E and Child Welfare. It's been created by the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare in the School of Social Work, University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. My name is Nancy Johnston and I'll be your narrator for this module. This online training module is intended for students and others interested in learning about child welfare in Minnesota and the United States. It will take you about one and a half hours to complete. The learning objectives for this module are to understand the importance of Title IV-E for child welfare workers and their clients, understand the policy implications for current and future child welfare services and systems, and understand child welfare's responsibilities and the opportunities within this federal law called Title IV-E. It may be that you're not sure what Title IV-E means. That would not be unusual. We find that social work students studying child welfare practice and professionals in the field are often not sure about its meaning and importance. Please click on this link to watch a video that illustrates this point. Before we talk about the current child welfare system and Title IV-E, it's important to review the history of our country's attitudes, policies, and practices for the protection and care of children. As is true for many of our laws and policies, many of our legal principles were brought with the European colonizers of the 17th century. The legal principle of parents patriae, or parent of the country, refers to the power of the state to intervene and protect people unable to look after themselves. This power originally was restricted to property and children could be considered property in some cases until the 19th century. Sometimes it was used to justify state intervention with poor families. In the early colonies, local governments, private institutions, and members of a community took responsibility for abused and neglected children, sometimes informally or through a process of indenture to responsible families. Native children were cared for in the tribal cultures. Laws to protect children and to remove them from their families began to be legislated by states in the 1800s, although the laws were not always enforced. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, later the American Humane Society, helped to pass these laws and in 1835 founded the National Federation for Child Rescue Agencies whose members focused on investigation and often commitment of children to institutions. Eventually there was a split between the rescue societies and casework services agencies. In the 1930s, public and private agencies emphasized service delivery standards and worker training, and public child welfare and child protection started to be recognized as a specialized area of social work. See the resources slides at the end of the presentation for more on this early history in child welfare. Meanwhile, the federal government, in addition to enacting policies and programs to address the effects of the Great Depression, also recognized the need to provide funds to the states for child maltreatment. The Social Security Act of 1935 funded many public programs to help people recover from the devastating economic conditions. Among these efforts was legislation for public assistance for children and child welfare services, designated, quote, for the protection and care of homeless, dependent, and neglected children and children in danger of becoming delinquent. The Social Security Act created AFDC, originally ADC, or Aid to Dependent Children, and later called Aid to Families with Dependent Children. AFDC grew out of the recognition that poor families needed public aid to avoid the conditions that could lead to removal of their children. AFDC was means-tested, that is, families had to have specified amounts of income, or means, to receive public aid. The Social Security Act 
under Titles 4A and B, provided aid to families to protect children from abuse and neglect, and to give support to families. If the term AFDC is not familiar to you, it may be because AFDC was replaced in 1996 with Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, or TANF. However, the pre-1996 income eligibility test still remains. That is, states receive reimbursement for specific services only for families who meet the income level requirements that were in effect in 1996. This issue is discussed further in slide 19. There had always been public awareness that some children were abused and or neglected, but for the most part it was felt that individuals and the government should not interfere in family life. Some medical and other professionals had concerns about child injuries, but there was no legal mandate to interfere with families, and few did. An article by a pediatric radiologist in the 1940s brought attention to the problem of broken bones in children. Pediatric radiologists had begun to label these injuries a syndrome, which became known as the battered child syndrome. A research study in the 1960s by Dr. Henry Kempe and others illustrated that many childhood accidents were in fact a result of abuse by parents and caretakers. And the research published by the AMA called further attention to the role of professionals. These findings and the establishment by physicians of standardized measures for suspected physical injury helped concerned professionals advocate on behalf of children for their protection, safety, and well-being. Doctors, social workers, and other professionals and groups also began promoting mandatory reporting laws to their legislative bodies. In the mid-1960s, states began enacting such laws. In 1963, the U.S. Children's Bureau developed the first model reporting statute, which created greater uniformity among the states. By 1966, 49 states had enacted some form of a mandatory reporting law. Other activities had also helped focus government attention on the needs of children in out-of-home care. In 1961, a study had been commissioned by the Children's Bureau and the Child Welfare League of America to describe children and families receiving child welfare services, which were largely provided by state and local governments and voluntary agencies. Other than federal regulations ensuring that children met the eligibility requirements for AFDC, there was little regulation of foster care programs. The study, known as the Jeter study for its author, described a system in which 75% of children receiving child welfare services were in the public child welfare system, and 47% of these were in foster care. Among the findings were that minority children were overrepresented in foster care in both the public and private systems, 29% compared to the fact that minority groups represented only 11.4% of the population in 1960. Racial disparities in the child welfare system still exist today and will be discussed later. It was also found that the case plan goal for 64% of the foster care children was continuation in foster care. In 1969, the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare mandated the separation of financial and social services offered to families within Title IV-A. The purpose for the separation was to free social workers from the role of determining eligibility for financial assistance and so that they could be less intrusive in the family's life. The result was that unless there were problems extreme enough to warrant child welfare intervention, services were not offered to families, and the demand for services declined.
How did more federal involvement develop from these concerns and activities? As we learned earlier, beginning in 1935, the Social Security Act was the only source of federal funding for child welfare services. But the primary responsibility for child welfare services did, and still does, rest with the states. Until 1961, Title IV-B was the only source of federal funding for child welfare services, providing grants to states based on the size of their population of children. Funds from 4B could be used for a range of services with no income or categorical eligibility requirements. What changed was that in 1961, Title IV-A of the Social Security Act was amended to allow federal funds to be used for court-ordered foster care placements of children from AFDC eligible, that is, low-income families. States were required to either provide financial support, that is, AFDC, to families while Im working to improve conditions in the home, or to provide other living arrangements for these children. It's important to note that this new funding was biased toward out-of-home placements. There was no ceiling on the funding. The legislation that authorized this assistance was developed to end the financial disincentives to removing children from unsafe homes, as there was no limit on the Title IV-A funding that a state could receive for foster care payments. And removing the disincentives meant increasing the incentives, or at least making it easier to justify removing children from their homes and into out-of-home placements. After 1961, there may have been more incentive in the form of federal funds to remove children in cases where abuse and neglect were identified, but there was also some confusion and disagreement about what constituted abuse and neglect and to what extent the government should intervene. By 1966, mandatory reporting laws had been established, but they were not uniformly accepted or applied across professional communities. The need for a uniform policy and procedures was recognized, and in 1974 there was a major step in creating a single federal focus for preventing and responding to child abuse and neglect, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, or CAPTA. In order for states to receive funds, they were now required to have procedures for investigation, reporting, and responding to allegations of abuse and neglect, and for assuring children's safety. CAPTA also required states to define child abuse and neglect in a way that is consistent with the federal definition, which is, quote, at a minimum, any recent act or failure to act on the part of a parent or caretaker which results in death, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse or exploitation, or an act or failure to act which presents an imminent risk of serious harm." Unquote. For more extensive definitions and for how states have expanded on these definitions, see Resources Slide 3. CAPTA also created the National Center on Child Abuse and Neglect, or NCAN, which creates federal grant programs new research and demonstration projects. Another important service established under CAPTA was the National Clearinghouse on Child Abuse and Neglect Information, which has been incorporated into the Child Information Gateway, a website that offers a wide range of policy and practice resources on child abuse and neglect. We recommend that you look at this resource at www childwelfare.gov for your own information. The importance of CAPTA to the development of our child welfare system cannot be overemphasized. Since its enactment in 1974, this law has been reauthorized by Congress many times, most recently in December 2010. Amendments to the original authorization have been the result of ongoing research about 
how to better protect children from abuse and neglect and improve their safety and well-being. Changes in policies and practice in a number of critical areas include adoption reform and opportunities for funding, family violence prevention and services, abandoned infant services, differential response in child protective services, developing and expanding collaborations with domestic violence and substance abuse entities, and establishment of tribal recognition and representation in services for Native children and families. CAPTA, since its inception, has also funded grants for research, training, technical assistance, information collection, and innovation. In the same year that CAPTA was enacted, 1974, there had been a U.S. Senate hearing at which William Byler, Executive Director of the Association on American Indian Affairs, reported that, quote, about 25 percent of all American Indian children were taken away from their families. Mr. Byler also reported that in Minnesota, Indian children were placed in foster or adoptive homes at the rate of five times or 500 percent greater than non-Indian children. Unfortunately, racial disparities still exist in the native populations. Despite a 1978 law meant to address these inequities, the Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA. ICWA was enacted to establish standards for the placement of Indian children in foster and adoptive homes and to prevent the breakup of Indian families. The Act established, among other requirements, minimum federal standards for removal of Indian children from their families, required Indian children to be placed in foster or adoptive homes that reflect Indian culture, created exclusive tribal jurisdiction over all Indian child custody proceedings when requested by the tribe, parent, or Indian custodian granted preference to Indian family environments in adoptive and foster care placement, required state and federal courts to give full faith and credit to tribal court decrees, and set a standard of proof for terminating Indian parents' parental rights that required the proof to be beyond a reasonable doubt. The ICWA policies require that social workers and others must be aware of the law and measures to prevent potential out-of-home placements and that active efforts must be given to Indian family cases. Active efforts specifies a higher standard than the reasonable efforts required for all child welfare cases. It's important to note that racial disparities in the child welfare system also exist for African American, Hispanic of any race, and some Asian American children. It was discussed here because Indian families have federal and state laws that offer protection in child protection proceedings and out-of-home placement of Indian children. The Minnesota Department of Human Services Report on Child Welfare Disparities, published in February 2010, stated that, quote, When compared to white children, children of color, and tribally affiliated children, with the exception of Asian and Pacific Islander children, are overrepresented and experience a higher rate of involvement in child protective services, out-of-home placement, and adoption. End quote. Racial disparity in child welfare, also called disproportionality, is defined as existing when the percentage of a racial or ethnic group is at least one and a half times the percentage of children of that racial or ethnic group in a state's population. There are many states in which the percentage of children of minority race or ethnicity entering foster care is disproportionately greater 
than the percentage of these children in the state's population. In Minnesota, there have been official efforts to reduce racial disparities for all families through changes in policies such as an ombudsperson for families office and training for child welfare workers and other professionals. The ombuds office is an independent agency created by the Minnesota legislature for families who think that they have been negatively impacted by social services and which responds to requests to help reduce the disparities in the child protection system. Despite these efforts, Minnesota and other states have not reduced racial disparities in the child welfare system. So far we've looked at Titles 4A and B of the Social Security Act and have reviewed aspects of the child welfare system through the 1970s. There had been a 300 percent increase in foster care placements between 1961 and 77 and while more children were being served we've also learned that the system was not always in the best interests of these children and their families. Research had shown that children were being removed from their families too frequently, sometimes without good reason and without adequate placement efforts being made, and efforts were not being made to reunite children with their families, and they often permanently lost contact with them. And children could spend many years in temporary foster care, adrift in the foster care system without a real sense of family or permanency. And so we come to the creation of Title IV-E. In 1980, recognizing the inadequacies of existing policies and programs, Congress enacted the Adoption Assistance and Child Welfare Act of 1980, or Public Law 96-272. The Act created a new title of the Social Security Act, Title IV-E, by removing AFDC foster care from Title IV-A and establishing foster care and an adoption assistance program under this new title. The Act also amended Title IV-B and Title XX of the Social Security Act and changed funding mechanisms to encourage less reliance on foster care placement and more emphasis on permanency planning. Title IV-E required states to make quote, reasonable efforts to prevent children from entering foster care and, if children were removed from their home, to reunify them with their families as soon as possible. This new law was titled the Adoption Assistance and Child Welfare Act, but the philosophy behind the law was that reunification with the child's family was the preferable goal followed by placement with kin and adoption. This law was legal recognition that the child welfare system should try to prevent long-term foster care, which research has shown can be harmful to children's long-term development and was the least desirable goal for children. Therefore, Title IV-E was enacted in order that the states establish programs for adoption assistance to prospective adoptive parents, strengthen their programs for foster care assistance for needy and dependent children, and improve child welfare, social services, and AFDC programs. The major provisions established by Title IV-E were that the Act required states to make adoption assistance payments, required states to establish reunification and preventive services for all foster care, and required states to place a child in the least restrictive setting and, if the child would benefit, one that is close to the parent's home.
Title IV-E also required the court or agency to review the status of a child in any non-permanent setting every six months to determine what is in the best interest of the child with emphasis on returning the child home as soon as possible and required the court or agency to determine the child's future status whether it is a return to parents adoption or continued foster care within 18 months after initial placement of foster care and periodically thereafter during the continuation in foster care as we will learn later 17 years after Title IV-E was enacted, the permanency hearing time frame was reduced from 18 months to 12 months in the Adoption and Safe Families Act of 1997. By complying with the new regulations of 4-E, funds were provided to states in the form of reimbursement to meet the new goals of strengthening the foster care adoption assistance and child welfare services systems. At the same time there was to be more emphasis on helping children find permanency through reunification with parents or eventual adoption. The three major Title IV-E program components are maintenance for out-of-home placement that is actual costs paid to foster parents or other licensed caregivers for the care of children and payments to parents who adopt a child who is an AFDC eligible child and is a child with special needs. Administrative costs incurred by the state agency for salaries and overhead and training for current and potential child welfare workers who serve families and children eligible for Title IV-E services. As will be discussed later, a child's AFDC eligibility requirement for adoption assistance payments was eliminated in 2008 through enactment of the Fostering Connections to Success and Increasing Adoptions Act. As noted in the last slide, one of the areas of funding provided to states in order to meet the goals of Title IV-E is training. In Minnesota, training is accomplished through a number of venues, including the Minnesota Department of Human Services Child Welfare Training System, which provides training for new public child welfare social workers, as well as more advanced training for social services staff. The BSW and MSW 4E Child Welfare Student Programs at public universities that provide stipends to help pay for educational costs. Anna, in the interview that you watched at the beginning of this module, is one such Title IV-E student. And additional training for social workers, foster and adoptive parents, and later expanded to other groups, such as court personnel and advocates and private child welfare agency staff. This extension to other groups was made possible by the 2008 Fostering Connections Act. Now that you know what Title IV-E provides, let's review the requirements for reimbursement to states for out-of-home placement and adoption assistance, administrative costs, and training. You will recall that in 1980, Title IV-E was created to fund states to receive reimbursement only for services for the children and families who were eligible for Aid to Families with Dependent Children, or AFDC. AFDC eligibility was means-tested, that is, families had to meet income or means requirements to receive public aid. This meant that in order to receive federal reimbursement for services to protect children, provide services to the family, or remove a, the child from a home, public child welfare agencies had to determine if a family was AFDC eligible. In 1969, this changed so that caseworkers were freed 
from this AFDC eligibility determination role when the federal government mandated a separation of financial and social services within Title IV-A. Child welfare agencies no longer had to perform the complex clerical functions associated with determining AFDC eligibility. This was done by financial services units in public agencies. But the separation is believed to have had the unfortunate consequence that social services were seldom delivered to families unless they requested assistance and the preventive services that public agencies had provided to families before intervention by child welfare was warranted were then usually not provided. Another change was that AFDC was replaced in 1996 with Temporary Assistance to Needy Families or TANF but the 1996 eligibility standard remained. Therefore, states still receive reimbursement for Title IV-E services only for clients who meet the income eligibility standards that were in effect in 1996. In 2008, the Fostering Connections to Success and Increasing Adoptions Act amended the eligibility requirements for the Title IV-E Adoption Assistance Program, removing income limits for children waiting for adoption. This change in eligibility for reimbursement for adoption assistance was a welcome one for the states, making more parents hoping to adopt waiting children eligible for federal reimbursement. The revised eligibility criteria is being phased in for specific children over a nine-year period, which began in 2010. Under the new law, a Title IV-E agency must provide adoption assistance to prospective adoptive parents of any child who meets eligibility criteria for age, adoptability, and other criteria and not consider income. The applicable age for a child begins at 16 years old in 2010 and decreases by two years for each fiscal year until a child of any age meets the age requirements in 2018. This eligibility change does not affect reimbursement for children in the foster care system only for children waiting for adoption. A question often raised by many is whether or not Title IV E funds can be used for preventive services for families and children, and if not, why not? Title IV E did establish links among policies that were meant to promote safety, permanency, and well-being for all children for whom the state assumed responsibility, but it does not provide reimbursement to states for preventive and supportive services. It is in Title IV-B, which you have heard mentioned several times in this presentation, that we find these broader social services to prevent out-of-home placement and help support families. You will recall that Title IV-E offered the states uncapped funds for out-of-home placements. In other words, funding that would expand to meet the need. Title IV-B funds are not only much less, but also are finite appropriated funding. Title IV-B has been very beneficial to the child welfare system. In order to receive reimbursement for 4B, states had to meet the requirements for for e-reimbursement and also had to implement and operate a statewide information system in order to determine the status, characteristics, location, and goals for the children in foster care. This latter requirement has enhanced our knowledge and research about children and families and led to policy and practice changes. Unfortunately, there exists a funding imbalance between Title IV-E for out-of-home placement and Title IV-B services to 
support families and prevent placement. For example, in 2006, Title IV-E provided approximately $6 billion for out-of-home placement, whereas Title IV-B funding for prevention and support was only $637 million. The imbalance between the limited funds for prevention and family support and the uncapped funds for out-of-home placement has come under criticism from child welfare professionals and advocates. In 1994, Congress authorized the approval of waivers of Title IV-E rules for the purpose of funding demonstration projects in state or county child welfare systems. The goal of these projects was to allow agencies flexibility in the use of federal funds for support of child welfare services other than only foster care and to evaluate the outcomes for families and children being helped by the additional programs. The waivers that are granted are supposed to be designed so that they are cost neutral which means that the amount of 4E funding committed to the demonstration projects could not exceed what the funding would have been in the absence of a waiver and the states and counties are able to pay for additional community and in-home services not ordinarily allowed under 4E with the savings that they have realized from a reduction in foster care placements or reduced use of expensive group home placements. KC Family Programs has issued a report on several states waiver programs and found that a number of them do provide prevention of out-of-home placements and the supports needed for greater permanency and well-being for children. For more information, see Resources Slide 6. Waivers have allowed some states and counties to use 4E dollars to provide services to families or to expedite permanency for children who cannot safely reunify with birth parents. Some of these services include expanding relative finding services, in-home family preservation services, homemakers, increased staffing, and a variety of prevention and concrete services. These flexible funding waivers have been associated with reductions in foster care placements in Florida, Ohio, Oregon, and two counties in California. And this can result in lower foster care costs and a reinvestment of 4E savings in child welfare services and agency improvements and outcomes. Because the foster care population has been declining in the past decade and Title IV-E has been the primary source of funding for children in the child welfare system, Advocates propose that comprehensive federal financial reform would help states to stabilize their child welfare funding and provide the services that have been shown to improve outcomes. Until there is a more comprehensive child welfare finance reform, expanded use of demonstration projects through 4E waivers can provide an interim tool that allows child welfare systems to expand and improve family support services and permanency with 4E funds. In addition to federal money, states and counties also provide a large proportion of the funding for child welfare systems. In Minnesota, human services are administered through counties with state supervision. The state oversees federal compliance and implementation of policy and the counties are responsible for administration and implementation of child welfare and other human services programs. As the figure illustrates, Minnesota counties contribute more than three times as much as the state and nearly as much as the state and federal funding combined. It should be noted that because this county receives reimbursement of federal 4E funds only for those eligible children, as discussed previously, it could be paying for as many as 100% of the children in foster care in their county. 
The Minnesota County contribution of 49% includes not only 4E funded and non 4E funded out of home placement costs and adoption assistance, but child protection services, administration, and training. Of all the states that operate under the state supervised county administered structure, Minnesota consistently ranks among the lowest in contribution of state funding and among the highest in county contribution. Much of this county spending must come from county property taxes. Who can administer a Title IV-E program in Minnesota? Not only counties, but some tribes administer these programs through the authority delegated by the Department of Human Services. Since December 2007, DHS has entered into Title IV-E agreements with the Leech Lake, Mille Lacs, Red Lake, and White Earth Bands of Ojibwe. These agreements replace individual county tribal substitute care supervision agreements and apply statewide. The agreements allow a tribe to access federal reimbursement for costs associated with managing a foster care program for children for whom legal responsibility has been transferred to the Tribal Social Services Agency. Eligible costs include administration, training, and out-of-home placement expenses. The signed agreements with the Leech Lake, Mille Lacs, Red Lake, and White Earth Bands of Ojibwe are available on the Minnesota Department of Human Services website. In order for counties and tribes to receive reimbursement for their children in foster care, there must be responsible overall management of their program. This includes fiscal responsibility for federal claims, maintain documentation and case files for potential audits, develop tracking systems for Title IV-E eligibility determinations, six-month redeterminations, and annual judicial oversight. Ensure compliance with federal Title IV-E requirements and data privacy requirements. And tribes and the Department of Human Services must develop and maintain a Title IV-E agreement. To summarize, Minnesota is a state-supervised, county-administered system of human services. And counties and four of Minnesota's 11 tribes are responsible for the mandated public child welfare services in our state. As has been discussed, reimbursement of t federal Title IV-E funds is given only for those eligible children in foster care. Tribes and counties are responsible for implementation of day-to-day -day services, administering programs, and engaging the community in collaboration and integration of services. The state is responsible for supervision, federal compliance, and implementation of policies. So far we've been concerned with 4E policies and programs. What about the workers who deliver the child welfare services? While it is beyond the scope of this module to discuss best practices in depth, it should be noted that Minnesota has developed a child welfare practice model that identifies the values, principles, and skills necessary to assure positive outcomes in the area of child safety, permanency, and well-being. The guiding values and principles include respectful engagement with clients, family-centered practice, organizational competence, community partnership, cultural competence, and accountability. The values and principles of the Minnesota Child Welfare Practice Model should be reflected in what happens when children enter foster care. The department's website states that, quote, in Minnesota, when children must enter foster care, relatives and kin are sought to care for their children. Preserving relationships with family members is crucial to a child's sense of safety and well-being. 
When relatives and kin are not available, county social service and private foster care agencies recruit community members to become foster families. In Minnesota, more than 70% of the children in out-of-home placement were in a home setting." End quote. To understand what a social worker in foster care does, the department has developed a number of videos at their website that you can view. These training videos demonstrate best practices for caseworker visits and make the point that, quote, Frequent quality visits by caseworkers with children in foster care are essential to their safety and well-being at all ages. At each developmental stage, their needs change, and so does the focus of the visit." End quote. There are nine brief videos that each provide best practice suggestions for different scenarios involving foster children, including caseworker visits, overview, concurrent planning, permanency planning, practice guide, and child and family visitation, a practice guide to support lasting reunification and preserving family connections for children in foster care. If you're unfamiliar with the job of a child welfare worker in general, you're invited to view the video created by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill a realistic job preview. This video is for child welfare students and people applying for child welfare positions in North Carolina, a county administered state supervised human services system similar to that in Minnesota. There's also a list of frequently asked questions on this site that provide good information for questions asked by prospective child welfare workers. Many of the workers in the video are engaged in child protection, a role and function that needs to be understood as part of 4E. If you watch the video, ask yourself if the workers are able to practice the values and principles in the Minnesota Child Welfare Practice Model. There have been many amendments to Title IV-E since its creation in 1980, as well as changes to CAPTA and Title IV-B. Among these amendments are the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act in 1994, which prohibited state agencies from basing decisions about foster care placement or adoptions slow, solely on the race, color, or national origin of the child, parent, or foster, or adoptive parent. The Adoption and Safe Families Act of 1997, which promoted the adoption of children in foster care by, among other provisions, shortening the length of time to free a child in foster care for adoption, clarified reasonable efforts, and provided incentives to states for increasing adoptions. The Foster Care Independence Act of 1999 provided more funding for programs to help children make the transition from foster care to self-sufficiency, allowing states to extend Medicaid coverage to 18 to 21-year-olds who have been emancipated from foster care. Promoting Safe and Stable Families Amendments of 2001, which provided, among other things, funds for programs for mentoring children of incarcerated parents and amended the Independent Living Program under 4E to provide for educational and training vouchers for youth aging out of foster care. Other major amendments, the Adoption Promotion Act of 2003 authorized adoption incentive payments under 4E, especially for special needs adoptions and adoptions of older children, age 9 and older. The Fair Access Foster Care Act of 2005 extended foster care maintenance payments to be, be paid on behalf of eligible children through for-profit as well as non-profit child placement or child care agencies. And the Fostering Connections to Success and Increasing Adoptions Act of 2008, which was a major law that amended 
parts B and E of Title IV to connect and support relative caregivers, improve outcomes for children in foster care, provide for tribal foster care and adoption access, improve incentives for adoption, and other purposes, including extending reimbursement for training of relative guardians and many categories of professionals not in the public child welfare system, such as private agency staff and court personnel. As mentioned previously in our discussion of 4E eligibility standards, the Fostering Connections Act also amended the eligibility requirement for the 4E Adoption Assistance Program removing the AFDC standard income limits for children waiting for adoption. This eligibility change does not include children in the foster care system. For more information on these laws, see Resources Slide 9. In addition to the changes to Title IV-E and other child welfare policies, there's been a shift in child welfare practice based in large part on research and evidence-based practice and training. While child and family safety is still the number one priority, best practice has shifted from the professional child welfare worker as the expert or authority on what is best for the child and family to a more collaborative approach in which the family can take a more active role in determining their future. This strength-based family-centered approach has given rise to a number of programs and practices, such as differential or alternative response, also called family assessment, to child protection reports, family group decision making, developing safety networks, parent support outreach programs, MFIP family connection programs, and many more developed by local agencies. The goals of the Child Welfare Agencies remains the same to achieve safety, permanency, and well-being for children in the system. The goal of this module has been to increase your knowledge and understanding of the Child Welfare System in the United States, including its history and shortcomings. And although the primary responsibility for providing Child Welfare Services rests with states, tribes, and localities, we've seen how these entities must comply with federal requirements in order to receive funding. The creation of Title IV-E in 1980 was important because it created a policy framework and fiscal incentives to prevent foster care drift and work towards permanency and the best interests of the child. Title IV-E provided money to states to establish programs and mechanisms to strengthen foster care, to improve the child welfare system and services to low-income families, and to provide assistance to people to adopt children who could not return home. The philosophy behind the law was that reunification with the child's family was the preferable goal, followed by placement with kin and adoption. It had been recognized that long-term foster care could be harmful to a child's development and was the least desirable goal for children. Title IV-E and subsequent amendments were legal recognition that the child welfare system should try to prevent long-term foster care. We've reviewed how the original law has been amended since 1980 and suggestions for reform. It's important to note that Title IV E funds have made possible the training of many child welfare practitioners and that research and demonstration projects have contributed to best practices. I hope that this module has given you a better understanding of the importance of Title IV E for child welfare workers and their clients, the policy implications for current and future child welfare services and systems, and the responsibilities and opportunities provided by this federal law called Title IV-E.